At Baptist Health South Florida, it's our mission to care for you when you're injured or sick and help you stay healthy and fit. Welcome to the Baptist Health Talk podcast, where our respected experts bring you timely, practical health and wellness information to improve your family's quality of life. Welcome back, Baptist Health Talk podcast listeners. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Fialco. I'm a preventative cardiologist and certified lipid specialist at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute and Chief Population Health Officer at Baptist Health South Florida. It's not uncommon to develop some memory issues as part of the aging process. The question is, when should you be concerned that memory lapses or confusion are signs of a more serious problem, like Alzheimer's disease? Memory loss and dementia was the subject of a recent episode of Baptist Health's Resource Live program, which I had the pleasure of hosting. My guest was Dr. Patricio Espinosa, Chief of Neurology at the Marcus Neuroscience Institute at Boca Raton Regional Hospital, which is part of Baptist Health. We talked about symptoms, treatment, as well as real-life strategies to keep our brains active and healthy. Let's listen in. Patricia, let's start with a little level set. Um, we throw the term around dementia. It's something that obviously people are very fearful of in themselves or their loved ones. Can you describe or explain what dementia actually is from a medical standpoint? Always my patients are asking me, do I have Alzheimer's? Do I have dementia? Sometimes dementia has a negative cognition. However, dementia is a general word that basically describes cognitive changes over time. The number one cause of dementia is Alzheimer's, which occupies about 75 to 80% of the cases of patients with dementia. Then we have other causes of dementia, such as dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, dementia to pugilistica. Uh, another one that is very common uh, actually here in South Florida is dementia due to stroke. We call it vascular dementia. So dementia is a generic term, and then there are different types of dementia that can be caused due to different neurological illnesses or insults. From the average person who experiences something, how, how, how do we address if, um, you know, I forget where I put my keys or again, someone's name, I just can't remember, but you'll arguably remember it later. You know, these senior moments, so to speak. Um, what would be signs or signals that something someone's experiencing or a loved one is experiencing warrants a little bit more further attention? What could be considered normal parts of aging and normal parts of people's behavior? So what we look definitely is for a change, a change in the cognition. We all forget some little things here and there, like we forget where we place the keys. Um, sometimes we forget a little bit, you know, where the car was, but we find it, you know, when we recover that memory that was missing from them, it's okay, we all have those little problems. However, when we see a change in the normal cognition of somebody, so let's say somebody becomes very repetitive, they tend to ask the same question over and over again. So are we going to the doctor today? Yes, we're going to the doctor today at eight. And then five ten minutes later, again, the same question over and over again. So this type of memory problems that need a little bit of help to recover. So those are warning signs. For instance, too, most people normally know what's today's date or the year or the season, some basic orientation facts. When we start seeing a change in that normal cognitive behavior is when we have to be worried and concerned and seek medical attention. Not everything that causes memory loss is dementia or a chronic neurological condition. There are some other conditions that we can treat and can uh, actually revert. So that's part of the workup that we do as neurologists is to make sure somebody doesn't have a reversible cause of memory loss. So someone's now coming to you concerned that they may have some early signs of dementia. What, how do you evaluate them? What processes do you go through to both assess and, and, and then we can get into uh, treatments? We typically require a caregiver or somebody that knows about the normal behavior of the person to give us some feedback. So it's very important for the memory assessment to bring somebody that knows you or, or has experienced what the memory problems are. Once we do that, we collect a lot of information about the history, when the memory are lacking, or what are the situations that have caused the memory loss. For instance, you know, we had a patient that was driving the car here in South Florida and was going to a doctor appointment and next thing the patient you know is in Key Largo. So things like that. So that's a major event. We also look at medical conditions. Sometimes patients may have chronic conditions. Sometimes depression can mimic also memory problems. We call it pseudo-dementia. We also look at the medications. There are some medications that we call anticholinergic that may be associated with uh, 
um, cognitive changes. We also do look at the social history. Maybe sometimes patients drink a little bit too much. This is a, a dementia actually related to alcohol. It's called alcohol-related dementia. We also ask about the family history. We know that some um, patients have a higher risk of having dementia if they have uh, close relatives with dementia illness. And then after that, we go into a physical and neurological examination. And within the neurological examination, we do a cognitive assessment, basically where we test the memory in multiple domains, orientation, you know, uh, date, time, we give patients a few um, words to recall. And in that way, we have an idea where the memory uh, and the status of the cognition of the patient is. We typically order a brain imaging, preferably an MRI of the brain. Why is it important to get an MRI of the brain? For a couple of reasons. One, because there may be a tumor or a mass that may be pushing on the brain and may mimic dementia. We have seen this in practice multiple times when patients may have these big frontal tumors that can cause cognitive changes that mimic, you know, a neurodegenerative condition where by you removing the tumor, patients improve dramatically, actually. Also, too, here in the center, we have an MRI with a software that help us measure the volume of the memory centers and compare them to a norm. In that way, we can tell objectively if the thinning of the brain that we see to a certain extent normally as we age is normal for somebody's age uh, in comparison to a norm. So we have that assessment here too, which we typically do in oral patients with memory problems. And then we also, we do some routine that work up looking for reversible causes of memory loss, such as you know, hypothyroidism, B12 deficiency, autoimmune disorders such as vasculitis and others. So we typically, and always as a neurologist here, and we teach this to our residents, we want to make sure when we diagnose somebody with a dementia illness that we have the right diagnosis and that we're not missing something that can be treatable or reversible. So that's very important before we commit to somebody to, for a live diagnosis. Are there other symptoms besides forgetfulness that we should be alerted to? Depending on the type of dementia, there are going to be different symptoms. For instance, there are another condition called dementia with Lewy bodies, where patients can have um, fluctuations in their mental status. They can be good for a moment, then they become completely confused. They can have a little bit of Parkinson's-like symptoms, such as rigidity, tremor, and hallucinations. But this is different than Parkinson's, where patients with Parkinson's initially present more with tremor. These other patients have other features. So, so each type of dementia has a little bit of different features that can help uh, diagnose and actually prevent if somebody had a stroke, let's say we want to prevent the cause of the stroke so there will not be more harm to the brain. So it's very important to classify and to know the etiology of the illness so we can treat it appropriately. And in some times, if there's something lacking like B12, we can replace it and make our patients you know, go back to normal. So again, speaks to that individualized, customized approach comprehensive evaluation for someone and the change in the person's behavior, the change in their condition would warrant um, the evaluation to be expedited. In your practice, so purely it's anecdotal, of the patients referred to you for a dementia evaluation, how frequently do you find a condition, hyperthyroid, vitamin deficiency, et cetera, that's reversible? About uh, 10 to 10% 10 of the times, you know. Okay, so not uh, insignificant. Uh, not very significant because we're a big referral center. So when we get patients referred here, they have been already worked out by the primary care doctors or internists. So we get okay. patients who uh, have been already, you know, brought to the attention of all their uh, colleagues and they come here for confirmation of their symptoms. So thyroid, medications, other conditions, they would have been determined before they got to you from, from those numbers. Okay. How about, um, can you elaborate a little bit? You mentioned um, very cogently at the onset of this program, Alzheimer's versus other causes of dementia, and Alzheimer's being the most frequent cause of dementia. Let's spend a little, little time on that. What makes Alzheimer's unique? Are there symptoms or treatments? Are there symptoms that might define Alzheimer's? And um, then we can talk a little bit about how you approach the patients who yeah. may have Alzheimer's. We know that the main risk factor for Alzheimer's is aging. So here in South Florida, as you know, is a prime place for retirement. And we know based on epidemiological studies, that at age 65, about 10% of the population will have the, this condition. 
as we continue aging, when you get to your ninth decade of life, it's estimated that actually 50% of people will have this condition. As you know, it's estimated that in the US, there's about 5 million, uh, 5 million uh, uh, patients with Alzheimer's and probably over 25 million in, in the whole world. Alzheimer's, the classic Alzheimer's, is characterized by forgetfulness, the classic one, we call it the amnestic type, where patients, we have problems remembering things that they did in the morning or the day before or, or in the last week or two. They don't remember that they attended a birthday party over the weekend and they have to be reminded about it. However, at the same time, you ask them, what were their classmates from elementary school? They may name 10 or they may name an event that happened you know, 20 or 30 years ago. So the classic case of Alzheimer's initially starts with forgetfulness due to, um, to events that happened recently, what we call the short-term memory loss. When you um, have a, a patient that you evaluate comprehensively and you come with the Alzheimer's diagnosis, what are current uh, medical treatments and what do you see as coming down the pike to be able to help us in our um, assessment and treatment of patients with Alzheimer's? So currently, uh, we have two treatments uh, approved uh, for the treatment of Alzheimer's. There are, uh, there are two classes of medication that we use. Ones are called acetyl acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. You know, one is um, very well used in practice called onepicil. The other one is called rivastigmine. And there's a couple more. And also an MDA receptor antagonist, which is memantine. These two medications are the two medications that we currently have available for the treatment of this condition. These, con these medications, through the data, have shown to decrease the speed of decline of the memory loss. Unfortunately, to date, there's no medication that can revert, or for that matter, this is, you know, in parentheses, improve the symptoms. And I would like also to highlight the fact that, unfortunately, you know, there are all these advertisements about all these uh, vitamins, supplements, yeah. I don't want to say any, any names, you know, <laughs> in particular, but all those things have not been shown to be effective, have not been shown to decrease the risk of Alzheimer's to, to treat any memory problem for that matter. So I will try to avoid them. They are very expensive, very costly. And sometimes, you know, these medications can also be toxic because some of them has a tremendous amount of vitamin B6, which can cause toxicity. So I will tell all, all of our patients and, and people in Facebook today not to take any supplement unless it's prescribed by a clinician. Let's talk about some preventive strategies. You know, as a cardiologist, we certainly deal with the cardiovascular risk factors, the metabolic conditions which lead to vascular disease. And you did note vascular dementia is a, a significant a frequent outcome of people with these vascular components. What do you both educate and what do you tell people or family members um, um, of patients, what, what can we do to kind of keep our brain agile, try and avoid these types of uh, clinical outcomes um, um, of dementia? Yes. So the prevention of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease is very important for the brain and for the prevention. Actually, you know, we think that we can prevent dementia by treating cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure. There has been data that shows that if you treat hypertension, you know, not only you prevent a stroke, but also you prevent harm to the brain. And that can be not only protective, but can also prevent this disorder. So there's some strong data that tell us that if we control hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, we don't smoke, all of these things that, you know, are good, and important for the overall health of the heart, of the brain, of the kidney, of your lungs, is going to have a positive impact in the brain. So what you, Jonathan, do as a cardiologist, we preach the same thing for in neurology because we think that it's very important to have a healthy body. You have to have your weight under control. You have to exercise every day at least 30 minutes or, or walk, you know. All of these things that improve your overall health will have a very, positive effect in the brain. In addition to that, there's data about the Mediterranean diet, which has been also shown to have a protective effect and preventive of 
dementia and memory loss. So this diet, which is basically low in meats, you know, uh, fish, a lot of vegetables, you know, a small amounts of, of, of wine, a lot of olive oil have been shown to be uh, actually uh, uh, protective and that's what we encourage our patients to do. As, as you say, they actually, some refer to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes, similar to uh, some of the, uh, you know, the risk factors that lead to that vascular uh, and then uh, inflammation which can lead to this. And then the diet is very important which is to avoid the processed foods, eat foods in their natural state, try and keep your weight under control. So, so well said. What about exercising your brain? It's a term we use quite often. Is there really, is that really beneficial? Is there something to doing puzzles and crosswords and, and reading and, and whatnot? Um, we encourage our patients to do activities, to do engaging things, to attend parties, to go to book reviews, to go to seminar courses. You know, here in, in Boca Raton, you know, the communities here, they have, um, community events, you know, so to be engaged in, to, to, do, to do exercise, to, do, to go and work with, with friends, you know, to be part of all of these activities that will involve, you know, some critical thinking, also to play cards, all of things work. Unfortunately, there's not, you know, one thing better than the other. There also it goes to, to some of these other things that people advertise that, you know, do this thing, it may help you maybe do this other thing. Nothing has been shown to be, 100% effective, but what we recommend is patients to be engaged, engaging life, you know, enjoy life, you know, read, walk, talk with people, be in activities, be a part of your community, you know, help others, you know, all of these things are very important. Sleep. Um, sleep is such an important component of our body's health. Um, we don't think of it that way. We think of it just the absence of being awake. Is there a relationship between sleep disorders or proper sleep ha patterns um, and the risk of dementia? Yes, uh, yes, there's, there's uh, a lot of, uh, there's links between them too, you know. Um, two, as a risk factor, some patients can have some sleep disorders even before they develop the memory illness as, and such as REM sleep disturbance, which is a very typical, you know, thing. But two, you know, if patients do not get enough rest is very important. The average number of hours, depending on the person, is seven hours, you know. Some people can sleep only five. Uh, some people need nine, a teenager may need 10, you know, it depends. Another important topic that I would like to highlight and that we in the memory source world are working very hard is for our patients to avoid taking benzodiazepines and medications that work like benzodiazepines such as Ambien or, you know, Temazepam, all these medications. They have been shown actually to increase the risk of memory loss. Moreover, Studies have shown that sleep hygiene, which is to have a good behavior when you go to sleep, is as effective as taking a benzodiazepine at night. So healthy and normal sleep is without a medication. Taking a benzodiazepine or benzodiazepine-like medication at night can prompt people to dementia, can make people yeah to falls and to accidents. So in, in my practice, I have moved away from them. I don't prescribe any of those medications. The only medication sometimes I use is a little bit of melatonin, sometimes five milligrams. That can be okay to use it in certain circumstances. But other than that, I have moved away from these medications and normal healthy sleep is without a pill. If you'd like to watch the full episode of Resource Live, there's a link in the notes for this podcast. Before we sign off, we could really use your help and your feedback. Please take a moment to review this podcast and email us with comments or suggestions for future topics at baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net. That's baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and mask up. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. This podcast is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida, healthcare that cares.